Good morning. So glad you could be with me today in another study in God's Word together in the Unfolding Word series. We're in the midst of Daniel. We've been in the fifth chapter recently, uh, the period of time looking at King Nebuchadnezzar, the first four chapters is finished. We're now moving ahead to the very end of the Babylonian Empire under the reign of King Belshazzar. I'm going to pick up our reading today in verse 7 of chapter 5. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. In other words, the Magi order. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. Little background, if you've been with me now, you realize that things have changed. It's been 23 years since the death of Nebuchadnezzar. We are now at the final point, in fact, the final night, of the existence of the empire. Babylon is in its last days, just as God had predicted in chapter 2 dream. They have a losing war going on with the Medo-Persian Empire. And Babylon, the capital city, is now surrounded by the Medo-Persian army. King Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, again, either way is proper to pronounce it, now rules over Babylon, what's left of it. He actually co-rules with his father, Nebuchadnezzar, who is actually off the scene entirely, uh, living in, in a seclusion situation. So King Belshazzar is really the key here. He throws in this final death throes of the city, a drunken party for a thousand of the elite. He was convinced the city was not going to be taken because it was such a powerful city built defensively in a way that should have been able to withstand the armies. In the midst of this drunken party, he gets the cups from the cup temple of God that had been taken many years before by Nebuchadnezzar, and he uses them as part of the drinking utensils as a way of ridiculing God, demonstrating that he, not the God of the Jews, is in control of history. And then, the transition into our study today, the finger of God appears on the wall. He and all of his lords see this miraculous kind of thing going on. And words are being written on that wall. Scared them all to death, essentially. It tells us literally here that the king kind of collapsed to the floor. His feet kind of went out from under him. The finger of God, by the way, of course, is referring to God's action. We see that phrase back in Exodus 31. There's a description at the time of the writing of the original Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone, where it says the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Of course, so it's clear who's Who's the initiator of this message? Well, we ended with the message having been given and the terror settling in on the king and his nobles. We open today in verse 7 with the king's initial response. He yells for the Magi order's help. He called loudly is the way the ESV translates this. That's essentially shouted. And uh, once he got up off the floor from, uh, from his legs giving way in fear over what was happening, he shouts in this loud voice for the Magi order, the think tank of the day, to be sent into them. So as they arrive, he offers them in his fear some very high honors. If they can take and explain what's been going on here, what's happening. He says he would clothe them in purple. That was a, a dyed cloth that was restricted. I mean, it was, a, it was a crime to wear it unless you were in a particular elite position in the Chaldean society. Chains of gold. And finally, 
to be honored in a way as elite, to be given the third highest position in the kingdom. Now, why the third? Because Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar were co-reigners. So first and second were already taken. So the third position was the highest that could be offered to someone. But here's the point. Even if you have the third highest position in a country going down the tubes, it doesn't mean much. Uh, it just is not useful. You know, the truth of the matter is, just as an aside here, all of the world's positions, all that the world can offer someone, is like the position offer that Belshazzar was making to the Magi order. The world's best situations are jobs on a sinking ship. In other words, the world itself, the Gentile kingdoms, those in rebellion against God are going down. None of them last very long. That's been the point of some of the prophetic potions of Daniel so far. Ultimately, all of the Gentile kingdoms will go down to be replaced by the true and eternal kingdom, the kingdom of the Messiah. World's positions are like jobs on a sinking ship. Now, it may well be that God wants someone, one of his people, in such a position. Certainly Daniel had been in such a position. But it's a position that has, by the very nature of it, temporal dimensions. <laughs> it's not eternal. It's not worth uh, following to get as the highest goal. I was thinking of Satan's confusion in the temptations of Jesus in Luke chapter 4, where he was offering him these positions of the world, which he, to a certain degree, could have offered him and given him. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I'll give all this. It's been delivered me, I'll give it to you. If you then will worship me, it's all yours. I mean, it was an empty thing. <laughs> Jesus, the very Son of God, understood all of this was temporary and ultimately all under God. And to see it as a temptation just was not going to work. And so his response, of course, is you remember, well, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. In other words, fit the world's honors and powers in perspective. God is the one who is the true king and the one who has the right to demand your loyalty and the priority of your life. Well, he brings in the Magi order. Once again, the Magi order proves unable to handle the situation. It's another in a long string of failures for the Magi order. I want you to notice, however, that at this particular point in time, Daniel is not included with the leadership of the Magi order. That group that came in, and as it puts it in verse 8, could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Daniel is not there. Why? Well, here's what the most reasonable explanation is, and most of the Bible scholars support this. Daniel had been demoted and marginalized after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was his, uh, was his protector. He was key in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. Once Nebuchadnezzar died in these next 23 years went on with a succession of rulers, with each ruler, the Magi order, which was jealous of Daniel in the first place, gradually succeeded in marginalizing him, removing him from positions. And so by the time we come to this final night in the history of the Babylonian Empire, Daniel wasn't included with the Magi order. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, but Magi order minus Daniel, unable to help. And the result of that, as we see in our final verse today, the king was greatly alarmed and his color changed yet again. And his lords were perplexed by the situation. He and the nobles are even more afraid now than ever because the best of their think tank can't help them. Always the outcome, by the way, when you look to man instead of God to solve what seems to be the impossible situation. And so what was in everyone's mind at this point, certainly the king's, was where else do I turn? <laughs> what else do I do to address this incredible, confusing, 
and frightening situation. At that very point, the Queen Mother comes on the scene and brings Daniel back into the picture. We'll talk more about the Queen Mother and bringing Daniel back into the situation tomorrow. Thanks for being with me today. God bless.